Um, so oh, I'm glad Jason has got some fans uh, here. Uh, I too met him fairly recently uh, in Oxford last year. And just picking up from what uh, Sophia was saying earlier on about representation matters, um, I think he is a perfect example, isn't he, of um, a, an emerging black British scholar that one hopes will be a role model um, and, a, and a, a, a signal for change. So he made history um, earlier this year when he was appointed as Professor of Sociology of Education at Cambridge. And he was filling some very big shoes because the predecessor was Diane Ray, who I'm, I'm sure many of you know. Um, but I think what makes it all the more remarkable in Jason's um, case is his history, his life history. Um, he was born in 1985, so he's a relatively young professor. Um, he's, I think, the fourth or fifth black professor at, at Cambridge, but he's the youngest. He was born in um, modest circumstances at Council Estate in Clapham. And more significantly, I think, is that he was diagnosed as autistic at three years of old, at three years of age. And also because of what I think he's termed global development delay, didn't learn to speak until he was 11 and then didn't learn to write until he was 18. Um, and he had beyond that a, a meteoric rise through the academy. Um, he was, um, I think, I think at Surrey University did a BA uh, and an MA in education, a PGC trained as a teacher, as a PE teacher, and then went on to do an MED and a PhD at Liverpool John Moores University. Apart from his appointment at Cambridge, he's also a visiting professor at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. And his work principally sits um, in, I suppose, what you might call decolonizing the academy. Uh, I'm just looking at some of his research interests here. Um, and his key publication, and the one that brought him to my attention, was the 2018 um, book, Dismantling Race in Higher Education. Uh, subtitled Racism, Whiteness and Decolonizing the Academy. And that was edited with Heidi Merza. And it's a, a fa fascinating, really varied edited collection, um, very intersectional, so draws on black studies, disability, race, social class, mobility. And I think, um, and I'm sure colleagues will have mentioned this before, um, there are there are two or three, I think, probably really salient publications that that gave impetus to uh, this body of work and to to the decolonization within the academy, certainly within HE. And I think I would argue that this was certainly one of them. Um, a few key points from it. Um, he uses the acronym BAME, and I know that's not necessarily current these days but he says for example it's argued BAME students are less likely to be admitted to elite Russell Group universities than white applicants with similar grades you know and ask the question why what's going on here what are the systemic barriers to that he talks very eloquently very persuasively and very personally about the mistreatment within the academy of scholars of colour, citing things like unfair workloads, precarious contracts, racial microaggressions, and the sense that that builds, that cumulatively that builds to othering, that they are, uh, they define themselves as outsiders, and it's that imposter syndrome. More positively, I think, he talks about, and I quote, 
the irresistible rise of decolonizing movements to disrupt Western epistemologies. And I, I particularly want to flag this up because I think this is where it's really, really strong, where he and indeed the, the other contributors are very, very keen to deploy students and enthuse students as agents of change. And two particular initiatives, two particular questions are raised. Number one, why is my curriculum white? You know, that's the question that students are encouraged to ask. And the other one, why isn't my professor black? And I think those two questions are so salient, so powerful, so potent. And just one more little thing here. Um, uh, and this isn't from uh, Jason, Jason's work within the book. This is actually uh, Sarah Ahmed in Chapter 19. And she talks about EDI practices in academia um and she quotes um uh, sorry my quote is uh tick box exercises that's how she describes them to create a happy impression but actually no long lasting changes for vain staff i i hope i mean that was written in 2018 i hope that that is perhaps no longer uh, the case, the work that's, that's going on. Um, I just thought I'd finish with a, a, a great quotation from the book. It's not actually from Jason. Um, it's from Audrey Lord, 2007. And it's this. For the master's tools, we will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own games but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I think what Jason typifies, what he exemplifies, is that desire for change and is, I think, probably a real beacon of, of hope uh, in and beyond the academy. And I think what he's giving us uh, with his work are the theoretical and the conceptual tools um, to challenge the status quo and the fact that he is a first-rate scholar, um, that he has social justice at, his, at the heart of his work um, is just brilliant. And I would love if we could get him to Lancaster one way or another by book or by crook. I think it would be brilliant to have him in the department, perhaps running a seminar or something similar. Uh, but that's my quick take on Jason Arday, um, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much.